and then we'll get started in just a second. So, uh, Lisa, if you could keep an eye out on uh, whether anybody else pops into the waiting room or not, that would be great too. Will do. All right. So we are here today to talk about learning to work and learn remotely. This is me. My name is Michael Gibson. I'm an adult admissions advisor at Blackhawk College. Um, and so that's just a fancy way of saying that I'm the person that kind of helps people get started and navigate all the steps that it takes to get back into college. And this is Angela, she's my helper today. Uh, and uh, she works with the career office at Blackhawk. So it's her job to kind of help people with uh, assessing maybe what career they want to have. Uh, they do mock interviews. Um, they help people with jobs on campus, um, a little bit of everything. Um, and so she'll be helping me uh, today as well. And so we're going to start out with a quick poll of uh, the participants. So the question that I have for you guys is which office currently reflects the remote space that you have? Julie. She is. How'd it go? All right. So it looks like most people have a dedicated space with a door, which is great. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how um, that's probably the best situation for you to be in. Um, I know a lot of us who have now been pushed into uh, learning or uh, working in a remote setting uh, maybe don't have uh, a space uh, that is as uh, perfect as we might want it to be because we didn't really get to plan for uh, what it was going to look like. Um, but let's talk just a little bit about oops, uh, some of the things that uh, we want to keep in mind when we're setting up a space. Um, so you want to make sure as much as possible that you have comfortable seating. Uh, so try to stay away from the folding chair or even the hard chair in the kitchen if you can help it. Uh, but not too comfortable. So uh, one of the suggestions that was on that poll was, are you working kind of from a TV tray on your couch or your bed? That's something in general you want to stay away from because those are both places that our body is kind of uh, already trained to do something else at, right? So you're relaxing on a couch or you're sleeping on a bed. And when you uh, try to use that, kind of try to reset your brain to use that in a different way, um, it doesn't always work as well. And so sometimes you find yourself not really focusing or those kinds of things because um, you're in a space that's not really built for what you're trying to do there. As um, you want to find a work surface that meets your needs. So you want to think about how much space you need to spread out, those kinds of things. Uh, you want to make sure you have good lighting. Uh, so good lighting as in uh, lighting the, uh, for you to work. Uh, but one of the things you also want to think about as uh, we're moving towards a lot more uh, video calls and those kinds of things is uh, what kind of lighting that you have in the space um, that you're taking the Zoom call. So one of the things that I've noticed as we've spent a lot more of our life on uh, these Zoom calls is um, a lot of times people, if people are at home, they'll want to um, maybe have 
a window in the background so that they, you know, so you have the view in the back. But actually what that creates is um, a really light background and a really dark face where you can't really see their facial expressions or any of those kinds of things. So you want to think about those things. You want to make sure you have access to electrical outlets and you want to make sure as much as possible that you have that door or something that allows you to kind of cut out the distractions that are around you. So if you don't have a door, you might want to think about do you invest in noise canceling headphones, uh, those kinds of things. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be successful uh, when um, you're learning remotely um, or, or working remotely. So one of the things to keep in mind in, is that self-motivation is a big portion of uh, being successful in that setting. Um, so really kind of identifying what are your goals and objectives. Now, sometimes that might be something that's laid out for you by uh, either your supervisor or your teacher. Um, but um, it, you also have to, uh, in addition to kind of having those external goals, you need to kind of remember what is your why? Why is the, uh, this important to you? Why are you investing in doing this? So is it that, uh, you need a paycheck and you need to be able to feed your family? Is it that you uh, are really excited about this degree that you're going to get and it's going to allow you to work in a field that you want to? Maybe um, it's any number of things, uh, but remembering why you're doing something can really help with your motivation as to, to keeping you kind of on track as you're thinking about those things. Um, you also want to think about surrounding yourself with things or people that inspire you. Um, so having those things around you that make you feel good, that make you feel like you're working towards something positive. Um, and then kind of just a little trick that's important to think about is you need to kind of reward yourself along the way as, as you come up against challenging things uh, because as you do that, um, it's going to give you um, the incentive to move forward. So I thought I'd share with you just a little bit of a picture of my motivation and my why. Um, this is actually um, at my office at work where I took these pictures uh, because I um, had had a lot of time to set up that space to kind of be what I wanted it to be. Um, I'm still in the process of being able to do that uh, in my home space, uh, but um, these kinds of things can be helpful. So um, if you look, I have a lot of different kind of ins inspirational co quotes that surround me, things that uh, are uplifting to me that help me remember uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing. In the middle section here on the top of that, uh, closet, you're going to see a, a vision board. I created that a couple of years ago. Uh, keep it around me to, again, to kind of help me center on why I'm doing what I'm doing. And then the last uh, picture is kind of a collage of all the family pictures that I have um, up at my office. So uh, my kids and my family are very important to me and a big portion of what drives me. Um, and so that's a portion of my why. So I thought I'd give you guys just kind of an, an example of what that might look like. Um, so the next thing we need to think a little bit about is uh, creating a routine. Um, so before we dive too far into this, I'm gonna have uh, us launch our second poll for you guys to participate in. So when do you feel most productive? Is it first thing in the morning, after lunch? Are you a night owl? Is it late in the evening that you feel most productive? So 
So it looks like a, a slight majority are morning people. Um, this is not uh, necessarily a, about um, that there's a right answer or a wrong answer for um, productivity, um, but it really is about, um, particularly when you're working in a remote setting, you have often have a little bit more flexibility in how you structure your day. And so unlike uh, when we were all going into the office or when we were going into classes that were set at particular times and we didn't have a lot of say so over what those times were, um, when you're working in a remote setting, um, there often is a little bit more flexibility in uh, how you structure your day. Now that's not to say that if you have a staff meeting at eight o'clock that you don't have to show up for it or that if you have a Zoom meeting for your class at 10 that you can just not sign into that. Um, but it does mean that as you're working on projects or those kinds of things that you can look at setting uh, things at a time um, where you feel like that you're going to be most productive or maybe the hardest thing that you're working on that day that you make sure you set that at the time that you feel like that you're the most on. Um, so um, creating that routine, making sure you're kind of uh, prepping, getting a to-do list, those kinds of things as if you were um, in an office setting, structuring your day, uh, with some very specific goals of specific times um, can be very helpful. Um, and like I said, working when you feel like you're on the most. Um, the other thing it's important to take a look at is taking an early dive into projects. And what I mean by that is uh, that you need to take a look at a project early and when you're given it and really look at what are the parts to it and how long is it gonna take? Uh, because uh, oftentimes until you've done that, you don't know whether you have a three hour project or a 10 hour project. And um, if you start something three hours before it's due and you figure out that it's a 10 hour project, you don't have a lot of leeway. Uh, but if you do that early dive and at least identify what the pieces are that you're working with, it allows you uh, more flexibility to kind of set that the time frames with which you're going to work those those things on. Um, so effective time management is also important as you're working remotely. Um, so that again is looking at what your tasks are, whether it's tasks that are given to you. Uh, by a supervisor, whether they're tasks that you've created for yourself, uh, whether it's the syllabus in a, in a particular class, but looking at those things and developing a plan of, of when you're going to get it done. Um, some of the things that we uh, often forget to think about when we're doing those kinds of things is um, historically, how long has it taken? Or if it's a new task to you and you don't know historically, uh, maybe you lean on somebody else to ask those kinds of questions. Um, asking questions, so you really clarify what the plan is and make sure you understand all the parts of it. Um, it's also important to kind of look at creating a range of um, what it might take time-wise. So, what is the best scenario, what is the worst scenario, and what is the likely scenario? So that as you're uh, moving through a task that you've really kind of uh, evaluated and given yourself time for the very worst scenario, but also put extra things in there in case it only takes you the short amount of time or the in-between amount of time. Um, so those are things to think about. Um, time management is a much bigger uh, kind of topic and we actually have another one of these presentations that's focused on uh, time management. So that's something you're wanting to grow in a little bit more. I'd certainly encourage you to sign up for one of the uh, presentations that we still have coming up on the 28th. Uh, so that you can learn a few more tools about how to be uh, successful um, in, in your time management. So I'm going to stop there for just a second and see if any questions have come up. Um, 
I did not do our little uh, launch into how to use Zoom, uh, but it looks like a couple people may have uh, put some things in chat. Um, so you found that chat on the bar. Um, we did start out with everybody muted, um, but if, if you could use the chat to ask any questions, um, then I'll lean on a couple of my helpers uh, to share if there are things in there that people have thought of. So are there any questions or anything that have come up? All right, hearing none, I'm gonna keep moving, uh, but feel free to put things in that chat as things come up. Um, and uh, Lisa or Angela will interrupt me um, and we'll make sure we get those things answered. Uh, so the next thing we want to think about is organization and scheduling. So that can look at like a number of things. It could be your old fashioned kind of calendar, uh, paper calendar where you're writing things up. Um, it could be an online calendar that you're using or an app based calendar that you're using. Um, some of those app based things even have uh, things where you can share tasks or uh events or those kinds of things with other people if you um, are looking at scheduling something that you're working on together um, but it's important as you're uh, kind of planning your day particularly if you're sharing a space in in your remote setting um, that you're sharing uh, with those people around you what are those things that you're working on uh, so uh, for example, today when I was doing this presentation from home, I walked around my house and made sure my kids knew that I was getting ready to do a presentation at 10 o'clock. Uh, so that hopefully they make the choice not to bust in and ask me questions while I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> um, uh, again, kind of making those to-do lists and prioritizing them is important as you move through. Um, and also uh, making sure that you take the time to take breaks and that you think about what is a regular time that you're going to stop working on things. Because um, the other thing that can happen when you're working remotely is everything blends into itself, right? So if uh, there's no uh, driving to work or driving to school that makes that kind of separation, you have to make that separation for yourself. Uh, which means taking the time to take breaks, uh, whether it's to eat or just to kind of freshen your brain if you're getting a little burnt, um, or um, really paying attention to, you know what, I was supposed to be done at five or six or whatever that time frame is that you've uh, put where you're, you've met the expectations for your work or your schooling. Um, but having that regular time that you're going to stop and switch gears is important as well. I did want to share just a little bit of things specifically um, in relation to learning uh, remotely. Um, although I would, um, even though this is focused specifically to learning remotely, I would certainly uh, share that some of the things that I've learned about organization and um, note taking and those kinds of things are things that I've been able to carry into my work life and have been uh, successful for me um, in my work life as well. So I wanted to share um, just a couple of tools first. Um, so some of those things are, you know, your old fashioned to do lists. Um, again, those are things that they have electronically on your phone. Um, a lot of people will use Surrey for reminders if they have an iPhone. Um, or um, there are apps like Trello where you can set up a task list for five of you and whoever finishes it can mark it off. So that's a kind of fun thing. Um, there, you know, a lot of people use flashcards when they're learning things that take a lot of memorization. Um, there's also kind of an electronic version of that. Um, one of them is Quizlet. I'm sure there are hundreds of apps out there that are like that, but 
I know in particular, uh, my high schooler used that a lot when he was going through a foreign language class. He used uh, Quizlet to help him as he was learning uh, new vocabulary, those kinds of things. Um, and then there are a lot of different kind of note taking uh, options as far as at when you're trying to uh, take notes on something that's important for you to remember. Um, so there's kind of the old fashioned outline method. Uh, so you kind of idea, sub ideas, those kinds of things. Uh, there's the Cornell method, which is more of kind of question and answer method. I came to something that I didn't understand in what I was reading. So that created a question. Now let me go find the answer for it. Uh, there's the boxing or the charting method. That's a way of kind of grouping like things together. So you make sure you're learning things together uh, that are important. Um, then there's a mapping method, which is much more of kind of a, a graphic or picture representation of uh, what it is you're learning. A lot of times you'll use that maybe um, in a geography class or a biology class, somewhere where maybe seeing a picture of what something looks like more likely to help you uh, remember. Um, and then there's the five R's of note taking. So it's doing the note taking, recording it, um, then maybe kind of looking at it and seeing where you can reduce it, where you can uh, take out the extraneous things that maybe you wrote down and it turns out they're not as important. Um, and then the uh, sometimes rewriting it or reciting it can be important. So a lot of times the nature of taking notes or the nature of rewriting notes can help to kind of stick things in your mind and then being able to go back and review those things. Um, so now I'm gonna share just a little bit about um, some of the different tools that are out there to help you work remotely. And I have them kind of uh, in three different sections. So if you look on the left hand side, um, Facebook Workplace, Teams, and Slack, uh, those are a kind of group workflow kind of apps. So uh, those are really good if you're managing te teams of people who are working remotely. Um, it can allow you things like file sharing, you can have live chat, so kind of instant messaging, a lot of them have, all of them have a video conferencing and a screen sharing kind of aspect to them. Um, they have shared calendars and shared task lists. Um, so it's the ability to kind of do some of that um, information sharing, um, even when you're not able to walk into each other's rooms or sit around a, a conference table and share ideas. Um, then uh, the middle section um, are uh, more video conferencing kinds of things that can be used. So things for either video conferencing or webinars. Um, so some of those tools are GoToMeeting, uh, Google Meets or Google Hangout. That's kind of changed names um, as it's evolved. Uh, Skype is another big one and then Zoom, which we're, we're currently using. Um, so those are really used to, as much as possible, uh, kind of um, reflect the live experience. Um, so obviously not the same as us all sitting in a room learning, um, but does offer the opportunity when we are all sh have our mics on and when we're all sharing video to be able to see each other's faces, see reactions, see nonverbals, those kinds of things. Um, and then this final section here, those are um, online learning platforms. Um, so those are things that are used by uh, schools generally to be able to host uh, school. So grading, assignments, the ability to share discussion boards, those kinds of things. So Canvas and Blackboard are two things that are generally used at the college level. Uh, Google Classrooms has been used more at the first high school minutes. level. level. Um, it's not great. Uh, 
Um, so now we're going to talk just a little bit about uh, what thinking about what kind of method you're going to use. So we shared a little bit about those different tools that might be out there. Uh, but now we're going to think just a little bit about uh, making sure that we're using the right one. So I have another poll that I'm going to ask you to participate in. Uh, that could pop up here shortly. So the question is, what is your favorite way to communicate? And you don't have to answer just one. You can answer multiple ones if you want to on this one. All right, so looks like a lot of people enjoy text and email. That's not unusual for the, uh, the time that we're in now. A lot of people uh, lean towards in-person or video, so they like to be able to have kind of the real experience. Um, and then there are a couple of votes for phone and, and apps or fa Facebook, Teams, those kinds of things. Um, so, um, it's good that there's that it's kind of spread all over the place, um, uh, but I'm going to ask you to think just a little bit about uh, what might be the best ways to communicate. So, um, if you're thinking about uh, kind of talking about some delicate information, that's going to be something that's important to do uh, probably over the phone um, or in person. Um, you're going to want that to be as um, kind of intimate an experience as, as it can be. Um, if you're trying to convey a lot of detailed information, uh, you may want to think about making sure that you put that as an email or a text, something that people can refer back to. Um, email, you can put a lot more uh, information in than a text, but if those details, if it involves numbers or that kind of thing, it can be good to have something that people can refer back to. Um, the same with, again, like directions, phone numbers, that's the kind of thing you want to have in some sort of written format. Uh, so that messaging, email, text is important to look at with that. Um, if you're looking at something that's time sensitive, you're going to want to think about maybe using two forms of communication. Um, so um, one of the things that um, Heather brings up occasionally when, when we've been in these presentations is um, a lot of people have started to use email as if it were a chat. Um, so they kind of have this expectation that uh, people are sitting, waiting for an email to pop up so that they can answer it. Um, but having some recognition that people are not always sitting right at their desk. And so uh, if, you, if, if it is time sensitive, maybe you send a text and an email to make sure that they're most likely to see it or a phone call and an email to make sure. Um, you Also, if you're... Um, looking at something that's going to take a lot of kind of back and forth you may want to think about using some sort of video conferencing for that it allows for uh, more interaction you can sc share screens uh, you can again see some of those nonverbals. Uh, so you're going to want to think about that um, as you're moving forward in choosing the right thing so that uh, the communication is best received Um, and then um, we want to talk a little bit about making sure that you're communicating your expectations. Um, so communicating it to those people who are in your space, kind of like I shared before. Uh, communicating it to those people who have expectations of you. So that whether that's your coworkers, uh, your supervisor, your teacher, um, all of those people are people that um, you're interacting with as you're working remotely and um, a lot of times we can kind of fall into working in our space and and just engaging with ourselves when we're working remotely uh, but it's important to continue to 
uh, build those relationships with um, your classmates, with the people that you're working with, um, and the people you're working for. Um, so don't, you don't lose those connections just because you're working remotely. Um, so this is what we were just talking about. That kind of communication is p key, making sure you're developing relationships and taking the time for relationships. Um, so one of the things you want to think about um, is do you have a few minutes at the beginning of a, of a remote staff meeting uh, for people to just check in? Um, that's kind of what happens as people are gathering for a meeting anyway. And those uh, before and after kind of communications are often just as important as the during conversations. So being aware of that and providing some forum to be able to do that. Um, again, not kind of closing yourself off, making sure that you ask for help. Um, in the remote setting, somebody can't, you know, your supervisor is not in as great a position to be able to kind of float in and figure out that maybe you didn't understand something. Um, as well as you thought that you did. And so if there's not clarity uh, from your supervisor or your teacher or on what they need, uh, being willing to ask those questions and ask for clarification. And just being aware that um, when we're, that tone is often something that's hard to read even when we're in person, uh, but it's even harder to read when we're online uh, because we don't have, um, as direct access to those nonverbals and those kinds of things. So uh, being conscious um, that uh, as you're presenting yourself online, that you're aware of your tone, um, that you're presenting yourself professionally, uh, those kinds of things. I remember my dad always taught me, you know, don't put anything in writing that you wouldn't be happy to have on the front page. Um, and that may be a little excessive, but it, I think it is important as we're looking at things to, uh, um, to make sure that, that we're conscious that, that all of those things reflect us in the same way as if we were standing in front of people. Um, so I'm gonna stop for just a second. Ooh, I skipped back a little bit. Um, and see whether any questions have come up, any kind of, thoughts that uh, any of my coworkers would like to share of maybe experiences that they've had that. Uh... Michael, there was one comment that came through on chat and it just uh -huh. says many times messages do get misinterpreted and just a reminder, reminder to reach out to the sender if you're not sure of the intention or the meaning of a message, just to make sure that, you know, you're getting the information that you're supposed to get. And That's like very true. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And that's kind of a combination of that um, misinterpretation of tone and making sure that you ask questions and that you're contending to build those relationships. So, um, you know, we've all seen instances where people engage online or those kinds of things and it and it's much easier to jump to the conclusion of what somebody meant by something or how they meant it. Um, and the best way to continue to have a relationship with that person and um, really make sure that you get to the heart of, of what was meant if you, is, is to check, do that check-in. Absolutely, that's a very good point. One other comment came through chat as well, um, just touching on etiquette. Use please and thank you in your emails. That goes a long way as well. That's very true as well. And, and it's funny because a lot of times um, we think, oh, well, that's just a small nicety and it doesn't really make a difference or those kinds of things. But then you think about um, how you read something when somebody is um, engaging you in a kind of pleasant way and they're appreciating the work that you did versus um, if they don't do those please and thank yous, uh, then it can feel, um, again, it can come across as a tone, right? It can come across as, uh, as somebody barking at you or uh, just kind of putting orders out there if you don't use some of those polite um, interactions. So that's a very good point as well. 
Anything else? I know I had a, a colleague from just a, a different city that I hadn't met in person, but we had exchanged a lot of emails and she used all caps and multiple exclamation points often. So I really thought that she was kind of a, an aggressive person. And then when I met her in person, she was sweet as pie. So she was just very passionate about what she was saying, but what came across in the emails was almost like screaming. So just kind of something to keep in mind too. Even if you're a really passionate person, if a person hasn't met you, it might come across really aggressive rather than just passionate. Right, right. So that's a combination of that, like be conscious of what you're putting out there, but also do that check-in and, and give them a chance to kind of show that maybe that, that's the, the conclusion that you jump to is, is maybe not correct. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to talk just a little bit about recommended tech as you're working um, remotely. Um, so not all of these things are required things, uh, but they certainly can make your life a lot easier um, as you're working remotely. Um, so um, obviously um, in this day and age, there's a lot of kind of expectation that you have either a web webcam or a microphone so that you can have those interactions on, on a video conference. Um, whether it be speakers or headphones, something to be able to, to hear what's going on and make sure that other people can hear you. Um, so one of the things that's been really helpful to me is I got one of the headphones that has a microphone on it. Um, and with all the kind of extra noise that happens in my house, I'm the mom of four. It allows um, my uh, speaker to just pick up basically my, or the microphone to basically just pick up my voice as opposed to all uh, the kids that are stomping above me and those kinds of things. Uh, the higher speed internet that you have, uh, the better. Um, it allows uh, you to get rid of a lot of frustration um, as far as how long it takes to upload things or uh, whether things are buffering that you're trying to look at, uh, uh, those kinds of things. And then it's important to have some basic computer skills. So, um, you know, uh, particularly as an adult admissions advisor, sometimes I'll have people come to me and they really want to look at online classes because they can't come at the t regular times. Um, but maybe they aren't as comfortable with some of the basic computer skills. Uh, well, those are things that you really do need to be able to have to work. Uh, to be successful in an online class, you need to be able to kind of navigate, um, learn new systems, you need to have some basic word processing and how to load and do attachments, um, how to navigate for different things on the internet. Um, and if you don't have those kinds of things, you don't, you've never downloaded software on your computer or those kinds of things, it's going to be very difficult to, to navigate um, online uh, learning or working. Um, and as you're thinking about those technical things, it's also really important to know that uh, glitches are going to happen. Uh, we, we've had several of them pop up as we've been doing these little presentations, whether it was that we didn't have access to the polls that we thought we were going to, or uh, people didn't have access to uh, or people didn't get let out of the waiting room or those kinds of things, those glitches are gonna happen and you kind of have to be okay with that. Um, you have to learn from those things and, and make sure that you're working towards them not happening again, um, but they are gonna happen. There are just things that you, you don't have a lot of control over. It's also an important to kind of know who your IT or computer people are so, uh, Angela jokes that her son is her first IT go-to. <laughs> um, and then if that doesn't work, then she goes to our IT people at Blackhawk. Um, but knowing who those people are who maybe understand things a little better than you, know how to 
uh, problem solve in a setting a little better than you. Maybe the person who in your office who has more experience using Zoom or the person in your classroom who's taken two or three other online classes. Um, maybe those are people that you can lean on for those kinds of questions. Um, it's always important to save your work early and often. Uh, we've all been in a situation where we've done a lot of work and for some reason uh, didn't save as often as we should. Uh, and then uh, something happens, the power goes out and all of a sudden you've lost that work. Um, Microsoft or some of those programs have helped a little in that some of them now have those auto save functions where you can uh, go back and retrieve at least a portion of what you lost, uh, but nobody likes to have put several hours into a project and find out they don't have it anymore. Um, I've all, one of the things that I've learned too is um, that it's important sometimes, particularly when you're working in a remote setting, maybe to save it in several places. Um, because you may not have, if it's something you really need, um, and it's on the share drive, but you can't access the share drive for, because the, one of those I, IT glitches is happening. Uh, maybe those things that you really need that can't do without, maybe put those on your desktop as well so you make sure that you, you can access them. And then another thing to really think about is, uh, can you do a test run? Can you double check something before you actually need it? Um, so for classes, maybe you go in and really navigate uh, Canvas a week before class starts so that you can figure out what questions you have and what you can't find and what you can. Um, or uh, with these Zoom calls, maybe you set up a, a test Zoom before you do the actual presentation. That way you, some of those uh, first glitches you can get out of the way before you're in front of people. So that can be an important thing to think about as well. And then I thought I'd share just a couple of things about what are some of the common mistakes that we make when we're, we're in uh, a remote learning or, or working setting. Um, so a lot of it is under communicating. Uh, so that piece about not not asking the question, kind of being happy to be in your little corner of the world and not interact with people. Um, and what happens when you when you do under communicate is that people fill in those gaps without you, right? Um, so there are there's communication being had. You're just not a part of it, um, and then. Um, you get left to the side of something, some conversation that was important. Or maybe you don't ask enough questions and you work for several hours on something that really wasn't what um, you were meant to be working on. So making sure that um, you actually over communicate rather than under communicate in a remote setting is important. Um, another thing that people, um, kind of taken into consider or, or struggle with is that they're too flexible and, and don't really create any schedule at all. Um, and the reality is that most of us have well more than uh, a to-do list that's much longer than uh, we could get done. Um, and so there are always things that are going to pull your time. And if you don't really look at what are the expectations of working remotely or learning remotely, then we all have a list of things that are going to pull our attention and time in the space that we're in. Um, so if you are not um, saying, I need to put aside this time to take this chemistry test or to uh, study for this chemistry class or to work on this project for work, if you're not setting that a time, set a time, um, then you're always going to fill it with something else. You're going to have a kid that needs help on homework, or you're going to have a uh, uh, 
kids that want to eat dinner or those kinds of things. And then what you end up doing if you don't set that time aside is that you're up at uh, two in the morning working on something that still needs to be turned in by the next day. Um, maybe that works for you if you're that night owl person, but I didn't see a lot of people vote for that in this particular group. Um, and if you are that night owl person, hopefully you scheduled that time in the evening to work on that as opposed to it just kind of being pushed into that setting. Um, another thing to think about is that we all believe that we're really good at multitasking. And the reality is that um, most of the time our brain can only really function uh, well focusing on one thing. And so what happens is uh, maybe you're doing one thing well and two things poorly, or maybe you're doing all three things poorly. Um, but really taking a look at uh, what is it that you have the bandwidth to do um, and and focusing on that and then be and then shifting gears as much as possible because when we're doing that multitasking we're not giving either of the things that we're working on what they deserve um, and that not asking questions is just kind of a, a repeat of the under communicating you got to kind of think about why you're doing that so we have one final poll What do you feel like is your biggest distraction while working uh, remotely or, or going to school remotely? So it looks like it's pretty evenly split here. It's a little bit of everything. And I would venture to guess that most of us who are on this presentation uh, have struggled with all of those very same things as we've uh, been moving towards working remotely. Um, so um, you're not ever gonna completely get a, away from distractions, but I wanted to think about what are the ways that we can kind of minimize those distractions or use those distractions. Um, so minimizing it, part of it is finding that good location, being able to maybe close the door, um, look at a space that uh, you uh, can, can be the most away from uh, the crowd as you can. Um, also, it's important to look at logging out of things that might have all those little bells and whistles that remind you to pay attention to them. Um, or uh, some phones or uh, computers will have applications that you can run where it doesn't interrupt you while you're in another function. So. Um, kind of looking at what some of those things are so that they don't take their attention away. Um, not having your personal cell phone near you if you're, if you're trying to work on something and don't need uh, to be looking at it regularly because a lot of us don't have the self-control to actually not pick it up if it's there close. Um, then also one of the things to think about is maybe you, uh, schedule specific functions for specific times. Uh, so for example, I'm going to return all my calls during this two hour time period. Um, now that's not always possible. Um, but as when you one of the things it, that we struggle with sometimes as we're moving through work is uh, making sure that um, we don't kind of get pulled off topic. And so um, I know that if I start to return phone calls, it could suck up several hours. And so if I have um, a, some sort of a report that I need to turn into my boss, I might prioritize getting that done before I uh, make the phone calls to make sure that, um, I'm not going to uh, 
be interrupted or to take excessive time. Um, sometimes you have a job where you can control those kinds of things. Sometimes you can't, but that can be a helpful thing if you have that level of control over things to to be uh, to uh, help you to kind of focus on one thing at a time. Um, again, it's important to kind of communicate the expectations to those people around you, whether it's your coworkers, uh, you, your or the people that you live with, so that you're uh, that you're all on the same page as to what the expectation is. Um, and then there are also some ways that we can kind of utilize those distra distractions. So if you're a person that tends to kind of overwork on things, um, maybe you use uh, that time to fix uh, lunch or a snack for your kids um, as a break. In, in what you're working on. Um, if you're a person who really uh, maybe uses that that break as an excuse uh, to stop longer, maybe you do some fr food prep while you're at home so that you don't take excessive amounts of, of breaks around lunchtime. So kind of knowing what your rhythms are and how to utilize those things. Um, I know I use music a lot as a background when I'm working. Uh, it kind of helps me uh, just to focus in. And um, a lot of times I'll match the music to what it is that I'm working on. So uh, maybe it's something kind of slow and quiet if I really need to, to uh, think something out. Uh, if I'm working on the kind of monotonous thing, like putting a bunch of things into Excel or those kinds of things, maybe I use some kind of energetic music uh, to make sure that I, that I keep pushing forward on it. So thinking about uh, using some of those sounds in the background to your advantage rather than your disadvantage. Um, again, some people really like for it to be super quiet while they're working. Other people might prefer for there to be some sort of low background noise so it feels more like you're in a regular setting. And so knowing what works for you as far as that. Um, one of the neat ideas that I saw online that I thought was kind of cute for a person that had switched to working remotely um, is that she was one of those people um, that uh, could get off task easily and, um, you know, think about all the things that she needed to do at home at the same time that she was working. And so she actually used that to her advantage. And so she would use her laundry as a work timer. So yes, I'm going to throw in that load of laundry, um, but then I'm going to sit down and I'm going to work straight through until I hear it go off. I'm not going to use any other excuses to get up and work on anything else. Um, and then I'll use that timer as my key that it's time to take a break. I'll switch things out, fold things, whatever, and then I'll get back to work again. Um, so she actually used that distraction as something that was helpful. Um, and again, kind of being conscious of um, that we do need to take those brain breaks sometimes. So whether it's walking around your house or going for a walk around the block, um, a lot of times being able to um, take that time away to kind of freshen your brain. Um, I know Lisa, uh, can you share your story about your Excel spreadsheet? Sure can. Yeah, I had crunched in numbers multiple times, kept getting different um, end results on the calculation. So I just thought, my brain is overwhelmed at this point. I took a quick break, came back to it, crunched the numbers three times, got the same answer all three times. So I just needed to walk away for a minute so that the numbers made sense again. Yeah, yeah, it's like they all kind of run into each other and you're almost creating an issue for yourself if you continue to kind of pound away at it, but then you can come to it a lot quicker if you, if you come back, so. Exactly. Um, so just kind of overviewing some of the things we talked about, the self uh, of what are some of the kind of truths of online uh, work or learning. Self-motivation is key. Uh, time management is essential. Um, 
if you have those study skills, organization skills, that's really going to save you. Um, communication skills are going to really make sure that you succeed in that kind of setting. Um, and being able to have some sort of basic technical skills really is important. And the more that you learn about functionality of things and those kinds of things, the more efficient that you're going to be. be. Um, so uh, we've come to the end of our presentation. Are there any questions that have come up for people? Any thoughts that people would like to share? Um, anything like that? I do have, again, my contact information and Angela's contact information here um, at the end. Um, so if there are questions that come up after uh, we've signed off, we certainly encourage you to connect with either one of us. We'd be happy to um, provide additional resources, uh, answer any questions that you might have. Anything else come up for people? Nothing in chat. All right. <laughs> Hearing none, I'm going to share one last thing. Um, this little link is the same one you guys went to to sign up for this. Um, if you're interested in uh, and haven't already signed up for the uh, time management uh, presentation, we would certainly encourage you to do that. Um, we also are going to continue to look at what kinds of things like this we might be able to provide. So uh, we encourage you to follow us on Facebook or continue to go to that website to see what other things, uh, live sessions we might be providing. Um, we also encourage you, if you went through this presentation and, and uh, you thought, oh, it would have been really good if they covered this, or this would be a really good topic. I'd love to see them present on this. Um, we'd love to hear from you as well. Um, so if there's anything else that you guys uh, think of where you uh, think, oh, it'd be really great if they did a presentation on that, we'd love for you to get in touch with one of us and share that idea as well. Uh, so hearing no, no other questions, um, I'm going to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you joining us, and uh, we hope that you'll join us for future presentations, and we hope that you found some use out of some of these things, um, and have a nice day. <laughs>